This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Here you go. Somewhere. Thanks, Snow. Okay, so it's been great this week to see so many of you pass by my office with questions about your essay. I just wanted to um, make sure, do you all know where you're going tomorrow? Which room? So, Bouverie. Street, B124 is the room for your tutorials no matter which group you're in and it's down in the basement so hopefully you'll find that okay. Um, the tutorial um, notes I will load later for you so that you can access them first thing in the morning. I've just got to do a little bit of consultation with your tutorial team before I do that. Um, so also a couple of questions have come up about the citation quantity in your assignment being 30. Now, what I actually mean by that is in the text of your assignment, you need to show me that you've used 30 odd citations. That doesn't necessarily mean references, okay? You can have less references, but you'll have more citations in the body of your work because you might have actually cited one reference more than once. Okay, does that make sense? But what I would like you to, what I would like to see though, is that you've read broadly. So hang on a minute. Can I have you back for a minute? Oh, hey. Guys, can I have you back for a minute? I haven't finished yet. <laughs> so, but what I would expect is that you have a minimum of 20 references. So you're not off the hook. You've still got to show me that you've um, looked at lots of different types of references, okay? But you can cite one reference more than once. This is what we do in science, okay? You don't have to have 30 separate citations only in the text of your report. So I think you've all been a little bit confused on that, so I hope I've cleared that up. Um, Today's lecture is the end of module one, okay? So some of you will find this lecture particularly pertinent to question seven, if that's the one that you've decided to do. Um, so I'd like to introduce Snow to you, Professor Snow Barlow. He's had a long association with the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences when it was back in the day of being Faculty of Land and Food Resources. And he was also the head of school of agriculture and food systems. So Snow's been around the university for a long time. Have, has everyone met Snow? No. No? Haven't met, met yet? So um, he's got a wealth of knowledge about agriculture in general, but also um, as it um, pertains to climate change as well. So you'll hear from Snow twice during this course. Today, when we're looking at the Green Revolution and genetically modified organisms, but also a bit later, about the 3rd of May, you'll hear from Snow again, talking about climate change impacts on food security. Um, so he's a, he's a good friend and colleague of mine, and in fact was my PhD supervisor many, many years ago, so I'm very happy to have him here today. So enjoy the lecture, thank you. Thanks, Andy, and uh, I think it's still good morning. <laughs> what I want to do today uh, in this lecture, and we'll, we'll have a break in the middle, um, but to really take you on a journey and try and convince you of 
the central importance <clears throat> of plant improvement, whether it be by selection, whether it be by breeding, whether it be by uh, GM technologies, in the reason that we're here, basically. Here we are, we, we sit on a globe uh, with about 7 billion people, uh, more than 50% of that 7 billion people actually live in urban areas, live in cities. Uh, and the only way you can live in cities is if someone else produces the food for you. Uh, and I'm going to argue today, so it doesn't really matter uh, whether you are in a, you know, in a, uh, a sort of developing country area still using uh, uh, oxen to till the land or whether you're part of what people call industrialised agriculture or, or big agriculture, corporate agriculture. The genetics of the plant that you use and how productive it is is critical to you uh, for your livelihood. If you don't believe that, uh, the globe runs on, and you run on, uh, about more than two billion tonnes of uh, grains that are produced every year. Roughly these are split between the three major cereal crops, wheat, rice and it's coarse grains here but that's fundamentally maize or corn. Uh, and there's a, some sorghum in there as well. So the energy that you burn every day um, fundamentally comes from these cereal grains. You, there are a few other areas such as potatoes, such as cassava in, in different cultures, but fundamentally we get our food or our energy from grain. We get you know, protein and vitamins from vegetables, meats and uh, dairy product, but the sort of energy that keeps you going every day comes from cereal crops. So what I want to do in these two lectures today is to explore the evolution of these grain crops, um, you know, how uh, they have been domesticated as we call it, the methodologies that are used to improve their productivity, selection and breeding, the emerging technologies that are consist, you know, assisting in the continual improvements in productivity and perhaps the future challenges to global food security that the challenge of continuing to improve and to produce more grain every year because the population grows, people use more grain, so we can't stand still. We've got to produce more grain every year than we produced the year before. So where did it all begin? Uh, arguably, uh, one of the main areas that it began in was an area called the Fertile Crescent uh, in what is today's uh, Middle East. You know, think of Iran, think of Syria here, think of Iraq in here, think of course Lebanon and Israel in here, and Turkey up here, and the, the old republic, now the independent republic of Georgia. Uh, up here. And why did it all start there? Well, I'm going to argue today this is acknowledged as probably the first, the Mesopotamian or the, the society that developed between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers was probably the first great civilization of the globe and it could only become that because it had a lot of food because once you get a lot of food and you can store food, you don't have to be a nomad anymore. Two, you can have an army to protect yourself <laughs> and they don't have to be out harvesting the grain. And three, uh, and the most important thing in some ways is your society has time to do other things and the birth of mathematics occurred in these great Mesopotamian societies, the birth of art, not the complete birth of art, there was still a lot of rock art around. And we think, 
We don't know, but we think. One of the major reasons that it evolved there was it was a new, unique place in the globe where you had, on one hand, you had cereals that were their area of ob origin of wheat and barley and rye is actually in this fertile crescent area. Secondly, uh, what uh, perhaps people might regard less importantly, the centre of origin, in other words, where the grapevine evolved, uh, Vitis vinifera that makes grape wine, was up in these mountains here. Thirdly, uh, when you wheat and barley here, but then you had some uh, grapevines here, but then you had cattle involved, evolved in these Taurus Mountains here, and in the name, uh, if any, probably none of you are animal scientists, but if you're an animal scientist, you would know that the Latin name for cattle is Bos Taurus, and Taurus comes from those Taurus Mountains. And then, of course, sheep also evolved in the Zygos Mountains that are the modern day around. So there was a source of meat, there was a source of, if you like, more than labour, but uh, beasts of burden that could oxen that could be used to, you know, to pull ploughs, and there are grain crops waiting to be domesticated. So that all happened somewhere between, you know, it's thought to be maybe 12,000 to 9,000 years ago. It began. It didn't happen in isolation in the globe. If you look at the earliest civilizations around the globe. Mesopotamia was acknowledged as probably the first, and the Sumer is part of Mesopotamia. Egypt was not far behind. The Minoan societies was in the Mediterranean, also not far behind. Mesopotamia there. But of course, the very fertile and well Indus Valley, is modern day Pakistan, uh, was also a great society that developed, and that developed around uh, wheat as well. And of course, there was a Shang society uh, developing in China, but that developed around rice rather than wheat. And a little later, and not shown on this globe, was uh, American si societies uh, developed, or civilizations, and they developed around corn. Uh, so these three major crops that we know of, uh, all were the basis of the great societies that developed uh, when Homo sapiens moved out of Africa. I'll tell you something more interesting in a moment as well. Just uh, one little survey, you know, prior to crop uh, cultivation, you know, basically people were nomadic. They relied on hunting and gathering and of course you had to move with where the great herds of, whether they be buffalo or cattle or, um, or game were. And, uh, but if you look at north or of the 44th parallel of latitude, fundamentally it was all about gathering, hunting and fishing. But when you move between 44 and, uh, and basically between 44 north and 44 south, so that includes the equator, it's what we call the tropics, uh, tribes predominantly started gathering. In other words, they started cropping. And that includes Mesopotamia, it includes uh, Shang, it includes South America and North America as well. So, you know, what is this domestication of crops? Just, uh, I'm going to describe how only for wheat we could do rice and we could do corn as well. But just think, uh, how do you start? Uh, you are a nomadic herder in Mesopotamia. You notice there are a lot of crops there 
or not crops, plants with big seeds, uh, the progenitors of wheat. So it was a natural thing for people to uh, try and collect those grains for their own food. But there was a couple of things that, uh, as we'll show in a moment, that were very important to that. First, you know, people collect valuable plants and try and propagate them. It still happens today. Uh, they were propagated, but sometimes cultivated. In other words, planted every year. And people soon figured out that you know, the more productive the plant, the better, so you had to cultivate less. Um, if it was resistant to disease, it means you didn't lose your crop. And if it made really good bread or really good beer, uh, it was even better. So uh, you had this selection for yield productivity, disease, res and product quality. Later on in the cycle, which probably didn't occur there, people figured out that if you had two plants, each of, one, each of which had one fantastic attribute, if you crossed those two plants, you might get a plant that had both those attributes in the same plant. So you could bring them together by crossing plant, and that's the, the basis of plant breeding. And then uh, in many of our fruit trees, grapevines, perennial plants, we actually, uh, we do breed, but often we propagate plants by vegetative propagation. In other words, we take a cutting, we get it roots, and very valuable fruit trees are often propagated that way. The first thing about this, though, is you tend to start doing this in areas where you've got a great deal of genetic diversity, because if you're going to cross plants, you need a whole variety of plants to choose from. So that's what the Fertile Crescent was. So let's just look at wheat domestication. If we start up here, the Mesopotamians first you know, did cultivate uh, what we call an incon wheat, uh, which was the beginnings of modern day wheat. Uh, I'll show you what the uh, characteristics of that were. And then there was a wild diploid wheat. Uh, in other words, it had two copies of all its chromosomes called triticum monocotton. And then uh, there was a wild diploid wheat that were just naturally crossed. They, they weren't done by plant breeding. It just happened naturally. So you had a genome which was AB, and each part of that confers different proteins, different starches that make, make bread making much easier and making noodles much easier. Then uh, we, it multiplied and you had two copies of the, four copies of the chromosomes. And finally there was a wild diploid wheat called Talshii, which was actually known as goat grass, and you can see why. Uh, these are the early wheats, and you can see that there, there weren't that many grains in each head. They were brought together to bring three genomes together. It was multiplied again, and it became a hexaploid wheat, which, as, as for Sertivan, is what the modern wheat is. That's what we have. And this is what it looks like there. So if you go further, the other thing that was terribly important to this was the ancient wheats, for evolutionary purposes, um, they have a spike on the head, like many grasses do today. And they lose their seeds separately. And if you're you know, someone trying to gather food for your family, gathering food for your family by did I just drop this Sorry. By picking up individual grains is a very slow process. And you can never feed a civilization by picking up individual grains. Uh, soon someone found 
there was a variant there. There were ripe spikelets, and that is when the grain get ripe. But it didn't fall apart like that. It actually stayed together. And when it stays together like that, it means you can go along and collect each head, which has 60 grains in it. So immediately your productivity is, is increased by, you know, 6,000 percent. It's good. Uh, and then people selected that further where they grew a lot of stalks in every plant. So you could have 10 stalks, each of which had 60 grains, and then you're in business. So uh, what's interesting about it is when you moved from this sort of hen and then you move to this sort of thing, you suddenly got yields that were three to four tonnes uh, per hectare. Probably doesn't mean anything to you, but that's a decent yield. Uh, many of the Australian wheat, uh, uh, because it's so dry in Australia, wouldn't produce four tonnes a hectare today. So the Mesopotamians did pretty well. When you think about this genetic diversity that is essential for crop improvement, that you need to start in an area where there's a lot of diversity. And I'm just showing you here, you need to have a lot of plants to choose from if you're going to cross them. So just look at corn here. Oh, no, we didn't go for it. The Indian corn, you know, you wouldn't recognize these. This is modern corn on the bottom. These are all the variants in between, but it started out as something like that. And then with plant breeding and crossing, it ends up like that, or even like that, or even like that. The humble tomato, which we all depend on, if you look at all the varieties of t the tomato actually evolved in South America, in, in, uh, evolved in Peru, and this is what you're used to, modern day tomatoes, but you can find tomatoes of all colors, of all sizes, uh, of which all contributed to what we have in the modern day tomato. So variability is important. If you look at uh, where wheat and barley uh, naturally evolved in this fertile crescent here, and then in the next slide, you see where the collections, these dots represent collections that have been made for plant breeders for wheat and barley. So you can just see where they're dotted around that fertile crescent. And the genes from those are part of modern day wheats. So what happens when you domesticate a plant? So what usually happens, uh, rather than the plants getting bigger, they get smaller. And the reason why that's important in grains is if you grow, and the ancient wheats, even the beginning of last century, would be this high. And if you whole, put a whole lot of grain on the top and the wind blows, it all falls over. So you can't, you're limited. And then if you're having to harvest it, you've got to pick it up off the ground. It's not a good way to start. The big movement when we'll talk about the Green Revolution was an introduction of what we call semi-dwarf wheats, uh, which was uh, an amazing story, really, because it was discovered in Japan by a, uh, a Japanese biologist, uh, the, the thing called, it was called Norum 10 wheat. It wasn't a very good wheat, but it was dwarf, what we said, short stemmed and big heads. Then the other interesting thing was at the end of the Second World War, you know, when the Americans actually occupied Japan, with the American army was a biologist and a plant breeder, and somehow he made contact with the scientist who had developed this Norum 10 gene. And he took it to the United States. And that genetic mutation that just has two genes, two extra genes in it, has become the foundation of all modern wheats. But it evolved in Japan, uh, not in America, and, but everyone uses it now.
You also look to increase yields, shorter life cycles. Uh, you try and get all, all your crops to mature at the same time because you don't want to be harvesting at different times during the year. So you need to have synchronisation. And in some plants, not so much in wheat, um, there are toxic substances in that plant, and I'll give you a couple of examples later, uh, that it's a great plant, but it kills you, so, uh, which is not a good outcome. So we've had to have plant breeding to actually get rid of those tox toxic cons uh, constituents to make it a great cassava is the, the classic one. But then you, the other thing which we're not quite sure why, but if you look at the globe, there are areas of um, biodiversity, uh, crop plants originate, and there's sort of fundamentally about eight regions around the world, but you see how they sort of uh, form in this higher, hotter regions. Uh, none have really evolved in Canada or the United States, nothing in Russia. Funny enough, little in South America, and we'll get to Australia in a moment, but the really intense places of uh, uh, species, if you look at China, which is one here, you know, really 136 species of food plants have been uh, you know, domesticated from China. India was also important. The Near East in here was also important. And, of course, we had tomatoes and potatoes from South America. So there are areas where there's a lot of genetic diversity in particular species which agriculturists have used. Just to give you an idea of how good it was in Mesopotamia, uh, these are the constituents of the Mesopotamian diet. And if you see, if you look at them, uh, it's probably not too different to many of you. If you are on a vegetarian diet now, you would probably have most of those plants. And so the, they wouldn't be perhaps as high yielding as they are today, but they were there and they were part of a Mesopotamian diet. The other interesting thing is we shouldn't forget, and uh, this is a story that has not been completely told yet. The indigenous Australians are very old. Um, you know, the carbon dating sort of indicates that the indigenous Australians were here somewhere between 50 or 60,000 years ago, which isn't very long after uh, Homo sapiens actually walked out of Africa. No one really knows how they got all the way to here then. But uh, it's, it was very early in the development of modern of civilizations. The other interesting thing is, uh, more recently, uh, evidence has emerged that people found grinding stones. And grinding stones are just a stone that you get another stone and you make a hole in it if you can just like a mortar and pestle that you use in your kitchen at present effectively, and it's what you use to grind up grains. So, but they've been dated back to 25,000 years ago, uh, well before the Mesopotamians formed civilizations. Uh, and the plants that they were using, and these, these are just three examples that we know of, and were only observed, of course, at the time of white settlement in the 1800s in Australia. One is a thing called a yam daisy, which is a, has a tuber, which was a very prized food. Secondly, uh, a more arid grass called Mitchell grass that uh, grows very well in very dry areas had big heads, a bit like wheat, seeds not anywhere near as big, but the Aboriginals harvested that threshed it and made sort of like breads out of it. Uh, not the bread you might see today, 
And similarly, uh, more in the wetter areas of Australia, uh, there was a grass called kangaroo grass, uh, and it also uh, had a biggish seed that was able to produce flour and produce some sort of dough, and uh, it is a source of carbohydrate. So the Aboriginals, you know, a long time ago, uh, perhaps before the Mesopotamians, were harvesting uh, grains and building grain stores. Uh, we don't know that for certain, but we do know they had grinding stones and that people saw grain stores in the 1800, which was the first recorded uh, time uh, of those people. So it's an example, but it's also what was probably happening all over the world with, uh, with societies when they settled in various places. The other interest is we now think of modern Australian domestication, and there are only two plants that, uh, because we're not a centre of uh, biodiversity in many food species, there's only two plants that are not acknowledged as Australian. Not Australian food plants, there are plenty of Australian food plants, but plants that have become international food plants. And one is the macadamia nut, which you all know, which is sort of indigenous to southern Queensland. And um, it has been developed, but actually probably developed more in Hawaii in the first instance, but it came from Australia. And then the other one is, which you probably don't know, a narrow leaf lupin, uh, which is a protein grain crop that's grown largely in Western Australia. So uh, all over the world there are crops that have been domesticated. The major ones that have been bred, uh, we've tended to apply plant breeding, is that firstly, you know, where I began in this lecture saying probably 60% of, of us, of the 7 billion people, live in cities these days. So someone's got to grow the food for us. So about 90% of the world's calorific intake comes from cultivated food crops. That's no surprise, but that's the figure. And what are those crops? Well, as I showed, that probably 50% of the grain comes from cereal grains. These ones here, wheat, rice, maize, barley, sorghum and millet. Root crops are still very important at various places, potatoes, sweet potato, yam and cassava. Probably increasingly, uh, oil seed crops because if you look at the way you cook, uh, vegetable oils are a very important component of that. So oil crops uh, are very important coming from soy oil, cottonseed, oil palm, rapeseed. The protein crops of pulse crops, bean, pea, chickpea, high in protein. And then of course if you saw the radio program last week about sugar, uh, People like sweetness and the two big crops of the globe that produce sugar are effectively sugar cane in the tropics and uh, sugar beet in the temperate areas. And then you have fruit crops, which uh, this is not a complete list, and then vegetable crops. So if we're now moving to, you know, how do we make things better? We, we're through the selection phase. Let's you know, get more sophisticated and get proactive about breeding. And so what plant breeders in the crop improvement objectives, they really have tried to optimise two things. You try and optimise yield, and that is sort of biological yield. So you want to have this plant it puts as much of the energy as possible into whatever its product is, whether it be bananas or whether it be wheat or, or whether it be corn. You also, you want a harvest index refers to that proportion of the plant that you can harvest as opposed to the whole plant. So you want to maximise harvest index. And of course, we can't all have the luxury of irrigation so it has to be stress tolerance when in particular areas. 
The second thing you want to try to do, and plant breeders do this, is try to minimise losses. So the major loss, of course, is diseases. Your whole crop can get wiped out with diseases. It can also get wiped out with pests, which are insects and the like. And the third thing that you do, which is one of the big, uh, the big areas of loss in the world, is post-harvest spoilage. Now, how do you store your crop? One, so it doesn't rot, but two, uh, which is major loss, so the insects don't get it. And then, thirdly, you want quality, more concentrated products, improved nutritional value, and perhaps new raw materials. So how do you do this? How many of you, how many of you have studied genetics? Have you, you've probably all done first year biology, haven't you? Have you? Who hasn't done first year biology? So you know about DNA and you know about chromosomes. Most people would know that now. So what we try to do in traditional plant breeding we see a desired gene, a trait, in some species that our current species doesn't have. So you have what is the current wheat crop, for instance, but there's a high protein gene. There's a superior baking gene that might be in another variety. And provide they're part of the same species, you can get them to breed together. So that's what you do. You cross them. But unfortunately, what happens, you don't only get the one gene that you were looking for, you get probably half the gene of the other wild variety, half the genes come in as well. So you then have to try and pure, keep the gene you wanted, but get rid of the bad genes. So what it, what it turns out to be, I'm sorry for this complicated diagram, but it does give you a bit of an idea about how this would occur. And just look at the years down the side. It takes 10 to 15 years to produce, introduce a gene into a crop variety to come back into a finished product. So it's a slow process. So what would happen in a glass house, sort of the target varieties would be bred, and we call an F1 generation, first generation. Then you would test them that you had, in this case it's a black leg, which is a, uh, a little mite uh, resistance, which is very damaging to some crops. Uh, so you have to test that you've actually got resistance to that in. So you have to do something in the field. That's year two. Then you select the best looking plants that have resistance but all the other attributes you want. So that's year three, a single plant selection. And then you breed those plants to try and stabilize what you have in that genus. So you have year four, which is pure seed, and then a preliminary field trial. You do it again, and you have a broader range of areas just to make sure it will work. And final, you get sort of an F6. Again, field trials and year seven field. So when you get uh, a new variety, you're probably going to be 10 years down the track. And just keep that in mind because what we're going to talk about uh, when we get into genetic modification, because one of the you know, one of the big advantages of genetic modification is to do that much quicker. So plant breeding involves adaptation to the environment. You need a wide genetic base. You need to require genetic variability. You need to have plants that will actually breed together so they will recombine. And then you need to be able to select. The way you do it is largely depending on the breeding system that that particular plants have. And where you end up is yield adaptation, disease resistance and quality. To give you an idea, you mightn't think that 
disease resistance is important, but there have been you know, societies that have almost perished. The, the reason for the great Irish migration to the United States in the 1840s, they were dependent on potatoes. And this disease called tomato, to, to potato blight arrived and they lost their crop. So literally Ireland was starving because they didn't have a potato that was resistant to blight. You can have the same thing with tomatoes. You, if you've grown tomatoes, you know that they can get wilt. And this is what, in our major wheat crop, there's a thing called rust. It, again, you know, it is a microorganism, a disease organism of the crop. And it can come on the stem, can come on the leaf, or it come also on the leaf. So each one of them is a different form of microorganism, but each one of them uh, actually helps uh, to destroy the crop. So what happens in Australia at present, uh, have a, we have a wheat industry that's probably worth 12 or 14 billion a year, uh, and we spend you know, probably 300 million saving from wheat rusts. Otherwise, we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have that. And then there are two, you know, we, we don't have time to go into great detail, but there are just two, two broad types of crops which depend on how you go. Uh, one, you've got self-crop pollinating crops, and that's like wheat, it's like barley. And I'll show you more of that later. And then there's cross-pollinating crops. Well, by the... Self-pollinating, we mean that you could grow one wheat plant and in each head it would pollinate itself so you wouldn't have to have a second plant. Cross-pollinating is where you have one plant and it doesn't accept pollen from itself, it has to have pollen from another plant, another whatever plant it happens to be. And corn is the, uh, the classic one. But because of that, there are some uh, consequences. Because self-pollination promotes what we call homozygosity, which is uniformity. You get very uniform plants, and if you've seen wheat crops, they're very uniform. Where you have cross-pollination, you get heterozygosity, in other words, variation. So they're all over the place. And it's not very good if you've got mechanical harvesters. So what happens, and as the classical one is corn, which is a, you know, a cross-pollinating variety, corn seed is produced by breeding two different types of corn together to produce an F1 generation. And the F1 generation is very uniform. And corn is actually uh, started in the 30s, preceded wheat in increasing its yields enormously, and this was all about what we call hybrid breeding. There is, though, one, uh, one drawback to that is, and that's a, a characteristic of industrial agriculture, where you have hybrid corn, F1 corn, you have to go and buy a new seed every year. Whereas a, uh, a self-pollinating plant like wheat, you can use some of the grain that you harvested this year to grow next year's crop. With corn, you can't. You have to go to the, whoever produces the corn seed. Uh, and if you try to plant what you have, you'll have a loss of performance. So one of the... Uh, uh, We'll get it into... Has anyone heard of the Terminator technology? No. It was a technique introduced and, you know, people do some silly things sometimes, but it, the world's sort of largest plant breeding company now, Monsanto, <laughs> decided that to ensure that everyone had to buy new seed from them every year, they introduced a terminator technology 
into their plants so that they would produce grain, but that grain wouldn't germinate. So you couldn't plant that grain to grow a new crop. It was terminated. If you like. The grain was perfectly good to eat and perfectly good for animals to eat, and it was valuable. But you needed new seed each year, and that means you had to go back to uh, Monsanto and buy new seed every year. And of course, uh, while it, I'm sure the think tanks thought it was a great name, uh, the world hated it and they, they had to drop it. <laughs> they had to drop both the technology and the name. So, just to give you an idea and uh, pretty much uh, to end this first, first break, uh, is the sort of crops that are self-pollinated, in other words, uh, they are the ones that produce their own seed, are the ones that you, the big ones, barley, oat, wheat, rice, sorghum, uh, chickpeas, field peas, again important crops, linseed, canola, and then cotton, flax, tobacco, tomato, there's of course a lot more. But the cross-pollinated ones are maize and rye, so these are the ones that you will have hybrids in. Sunflower, hybrids too, hemp, so sugar cane, sugar beet, sweet potato. So there is a variation between the crops that you, uh, how you approach breeding them according to whether they're cross-pollinated or self-pollinated. And finally, just to finish this lecture, with where we're gonna start in the next one after we've had a bit of a break, is um, clearly uh, we need to have food for the global population. And there are various times in our civilization, in the industrial age, say in the last two, 200 years, when people have got ahead of the population and we haven't had enough food. And so what I'm showing here was the situation after the Second World War, essentially, that suddenly after the Second World War, where there's an enormous amount of industrialization occurred during the Second World War from 1939 to 45, we had an industrialized world. We had a, um, an explosion of people breeding, if you like. So we had more people than we'd ever had before, but we didn't have enough food. So there was a food crisis that began in the 50s or 60s, and what I show here, and we'll talk more about it in the next lecture, uh, we could see this coming. One way of seeing how much food there is in the world, if you just look at how many days supply of grain are in the world's silos, you can tell you, you know, whether you're insufficiency or uh, deficiency. And you can see in this critical period entering the 60s, the world's grain supplies got down to 50 days. Now, bear in mind that there's grain being harvested all the time and grain being eaten all the time. So it's not as though that they don't have enough to get through the year, but it was a crisis, a great crisis. So let's end there. Uh, and have, what do we have, five minutes break or? Five minutes, yeah, why don't we start, why don't we start at 12 and we'll do the second lecture then, thank you. that is but I'll should I turn this off for you?
Okay, let's, um, let's get started again. I will say, um, as we go through this lecture, uh, please feel free to, uh, if you've got any questions as we go, um, I'm quite happy to answer questions as we go through. I'm sure there won't be a lot, but if you have a question or a query, uh, I'm ha happy to answer it. Where we are now is I really want to take you forward uh, and you know, a quick summary of uh, what happened to the globe is that plant selection, plant breeding, the traditional ways, uh, proved to be extremely effective until the global population started to explode post-Second World War. And uh, this is the graph we, uh, gee, wait a minute, I meant to put this up properly. Uh, we finished on, so up until that time, uh, the globe, you know, there were hungry people on the globe, there were, um, but Fundamentally, the globe thought it could feed itself. It became clear after the Second World War, probably late 50s, early 60s, that that wasn't going to happen. There were more people and not enough grain, and as represented by this declining global grain stocks. So uh, there was a movement within the globe to actually increase global food production uh, very strongly. And it was led by, interestingly enough, two American foundations. Uh, it was led on one hand by the Rockefeller Foundation and on the other hand the Ford Foundation. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation established an international wheat and maize improvement center, but they didn't do it in the United States, they actually did it in Mexico. And this is a place called Simit, we call it. And pretty much at the same time, the Ford Foundation paid for the establishment of an international rice research institute in the Philippines, in a place called Los Banos in the Philippines. And with that emerged, you know, I guess it often happens, uh, you know, name the time, name the person, but two outstanding scientific leaders emerged. There was uh, the first one, which is known as the father of the Green Revolution. It was felt that we had to have a revolution, a green revolution, to grow more food. And um, this was Dr. Norman Borlaug, who died about you know, a decade ago. But, uh, and he joined the, he was a plant breeder. He joined the Rockefeller Foundation and was assigned to the International Wheat and Maize Improvement Center, CIMIT, in Mexico. And he led the production of high yielding wheat and maize varieties. And for this work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in, um, in 1970. There was probably an equally important person called W.S. Swaminathan uh, in India who led the improvement of rice, uh, working with the International Rice Research Institute. And the results were, were spectacular. <laughs> the Green Revolution, uh, between, if you said that, 30 years between 1960 to 1990, when the population increased, doubled in the world from three to six billion, but global food production in that time tripled. So we went from a, a situation, and as you sort of see it in 1960 and through some, by the time we got to 1990, um, we'd sort of uh, 
doubled the days of supply from about 60 to 130 uh, in global grain. The second, now how did they do this? Well, they did this uh, on the basis of really three important things. Firstly, they introduced new genetics, as I talked earlier uh, of the introduction of the dwarfing genes, the semi-dwarf wheats. Uh, secondly, though, that wasn't alone. The second thing that happened, people realised that if you were going to grow these high producing wheats, you needed fertiliser. So it was the application of fertiliser, nitrogen, phosphorus, and where possible, it was the application of more water as well, where irrigation water was available, and in some cases, the use of more land. So what we show here that, you know, in a sense, global cereal production was only probably at, you know, 800 million uh, in 1960, and it was well above 2 billion in uh, 1990. And if you look at the usage uh, of nitrogen in the blue and fo uh, phosphorus in the green, uh, you can see uh, that the usage of those fertilizers all went up enormously and the amount of water used also went up enormously. So it was highly successful. But after 1990, you know, we had food surpluses and people relaxed quite a bit. It was sort of, and this is, gives you wheat yields in development countries from 50 to 204. And you can see going up from you know, maybe 750 to going up about four or five times. It was so spectacular in some ways and uh, we were fortunate to have uh, W.S. Swaminathan come here maybe five, seven years ago, and he was telling me that the first year they grew these ultra-productive rices and wheats, they couldn't believe how much grain they had. In fact, they had so much grain, this is in India, that they had nowhere to store it. They, it was far in excess of their storages. So what they did was they actually sent all the school children home for the year and just converted all the schoolhouses to grain stores <laughs> while they built grain stores. Everyone was happy, I guess. Uh, but uh, it was just a dramatic illustration of how new genetics plus more inputs had doubled or tripled yield in, in a couple of years. So it was dramatic. What's happened since then is not as dramatic. Uh, and what I'm showing here now is the Green Revolution, the yield gains have actually slowed. And, um, and what we're showing here now, this is a global rice yield, just an average global rice yield here in tonnes per hectare, which went from about two here to well above four. But there was a period you know, at the height of the Green Revolution, you know, from the 60s, 70s, that it increased very rapidly. And you can see in the bottom graph is the average year, the increase over the previous 10 years. And for this period, from about 85 to 95, uh, every year, uh, the yield of rice would increase by, you know, something like 80, uh, 80 kilograms per hectare. Uh, it's a big increase. But what has happened since then, through to 215, that's relaxed back to what it was before the Green Revolution. So the productivity increases that we were getting in the Green Revolution have, uh, have declined. And what we're asking ourselves and the globe is asking now is what is the next technology that can give us another 
increase in these yields. Uh, and we'll talk about gene technology in a moment. But just look at, this is the another, if you take sort of a trend from 66 to 09, you know, effectively a period of uh, almost 45 years, you'll see at the height of the Green Revolution in the middle, we had annual increases in corn production. Uh, you know, there was something like 2.8% per year. Rice was about 2.9, you know, and wheat about 2.9, all pretty much the same. But when we got to 210 or 209, uh, we'd found that those annual productivity gains had actually halved. So we're now down at this sort of period here of about 1.3, 1.4%. But as I'll show you on the next slide, uh, we require, if we're going to feed 9 billion people by 2050, but also 9 billion people uh, who are demanding more protein, which is more grain intensive. So it's something like doubling food production by 2050. It's maybe 80 to 100%. Uh, and that's because of the following. There are two things that, well, three things that are really driving this. The driving for in further increases in grain production is coming from one, we've got more people. We'll have another two billion people on the globe by 2050. Secondly, as, and we'll, I'll argue this in the next lecture, I guess, as people get more affluent, people have more money. And when they have more money, they can afford to eat animal protein. Um, so they tend to want to eat dairy products, they tend to want to eat red meat, and also meat full stop. And that costs more. So you can see in this graph here, this is what we just for, if, uh, for human demand, but animal feed demand has increased enormously uh, over that time and continues to increase. But the straw that uh, is also breaking the camel's back <laughs> is that we now have nations that have instituted uh, energy security measures, so basically to produce biofuels uh, and the way people produce biofuels at present is fundamentally from food products. So they produce biofuels from ethanol, from corn, perhaps a bit of wheat, and biodiesel uh, from canola, both direct substitutes from the food chain. And in the case of Brazil and others, we produce ethanol from sugarcane. But we, we call them first generation biofuels because they're taken directly from food products. You can produce biofuels from other ways, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, but at present we're not. So, you know, what's happened is if you add these three together, suddenly this uh, demand is we're looking at we need something like 2.5 where we're above. Now, we're producing about 2.2 uh, billion tons of grain, we need probably 2.5. And that means that if you do those sums, it means that the demand, we are sort of demanding that we need to increase our productivity, our annual productivity gains from something in the 1.5 range to about 2.6. So we almost need to double annual productivity gains. And the real biological questions in this is, can we do it? Is it possible? The other thing that is driving this, of course, another way to look at it, is that as you ramp up the world population, of course, the arable land per person uh, decreases. If this is the arable land, for decreases here. So you've got to produce this food on, in fact, less land. So 
What new technologies are there out there that we could employ to help us increase this grain supply? Uh, it's saying in that there are two other, com uh, which I don't have time to go through in great detail with you, but it's fairly well acknowledged that except in South America and some places in Africa, fundamentally there's not very much land, new land available for agriculture. The land that is already and Europe is completely developed, the United States, North America is completely developed, Australia is, is completely developed. Uh, so uh, we're going to have to do it with, except for a bit more land in South America and a bit more land in Africa, it's going to have to be increases in productivity per unit area. So there's three areas which I'm going to talk about. Uh, the some are much newer than the other. There is uh, gene modification, GM as we call it, uh, gene, which is really gene insertion technologies. And that's now been, uh, you know, been commercial for perhaps 30 years or 35 years. Uh, and I'll show you about that in a moment. Then there are two very new technologies. Uh, there's a thing called CRISPR, which is, the, don't worry about the name, clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats, which is the geneticist's jargon for that. Just call it CRISPR. But CRISPR is an exciting new technology that may allow not so much gene insertion but gene editing, and I'll describe why that can be very important. And that's both for crops, but also for humans. And then there is genomics, this sort of new scientist, which is really around big data and the fact that we can collect so much data now about the performance of crops. We can analyze where the genes are, and we can analyze the particular productive genes there. So it's about really modeling uh, to identify superior parts of plants that you could use to increase production. And it's all about big sets of data and high-powered computing. So, why GMs? What may GMs um, offer us? First, you know, where we began and we went through in the last lecture, uh, We've started with domestication, hybridization, and selection. And I didn't deal much, but the other way to, that plant breeders have done things is just to subject their seeds to mutagens, mutant agents, and that can be radiation, it can be chemicals, uh, to try and get changes to induce a mutation and hope that some of those mutations are good. So that was, if you like, it's still current, it's still viable, but it is the older technology. The next thing we're trying to do is, you know, by definition, species are able to only breed within themselves. So we are looking, you can, using some genetic tricks, uh, now have what we call interspecific hybridization. In other words, get different species to breed together. They've got to be closely related. And the third one is somatic hybridization, and that is what that is really, is it's possible to culture cells from individual plants, and when you take it down to the cell level, fuse those cells. So somatic is cell uh, hybridization. That technology is out there. The next one is genetic engineering, gene modification. And the fundamental difference with gene modification is, and we'll go into it in a moment, is its specificity. In other words, you just insert one particular gene, not when you breed, you put the whole genes together. And secondly, of course, because you do that, you can take genes 
from other kingdoms and other species. So you can take exotic genes um, from, if in the case of plants, from microorganisms, from animals. Uh, well, we wouldn't want to do it, but we could take it from humans if we wanted to. Uh, so we open the opportunity to take useful genes from other organisms in gene technology. And the way we do this uh, is that we, uh, if we have commercial variety, as you remember we had before, we have a desired gene. Using biotechnology, we're able to insert that just one gene in this commercial variety. So you have a new variety, but you've added one gene. And in some cases, it could be um, you decide that there's a particular attribute in that society that uh, you want more of. So instead of actually adding a gene, you actually just put in another copy of a gene that is already there. So it has two copies instead of one, and therefore it produces more of whatever that compound or component is in that plant. So it's very specific and allows you to do a lot of things. It doesn't replace breeding techniques, but it complements them a lot. And it provides a way to incorporate new genes or gene combinations. But then you've got to really put that into a range of varieties to show you where you might do best. So what can GMs do? You can incorporate single genes. You can also switch off genes if there are undesirable characteristics, which we'll get to in a moment. You can switch them off, which means that uh, that undesirable characteristic won't be part of the product of that crop. You can do multiple copies, which I just talked about. And it provides access to new genes, traits not accessible in traditional breeding. And you can transfer genes from bacteria to plants. And we'll, we'll see that uh, in a moment. You can also, switching off genes, uh, I referred to it earlier, the uh, cassava, which is a, an important uh, energy crop in, in the tropics, and it's a root-type crop. It also produces cyanide, which of course is deadly to humans. And if you don't cook it properly, you can kill a few. But what we've been able to do now is to turn off the cyanide production in cassava, and it suddenly becomes a much safer food crop. Um, Lathyrus has also uh, some neurotoxins, the same thing has happened. So it's about switching off dangerous genes that you've got in what are pretty good crops, but they're only, they're dangerous because they've got toxins in them. So, as I said, we've been, you know, maybe probably 35, 40 years now in gene technology. Um, and uh, what have been the targets for gene insertion? The first one is agronomic traits. And uh, what do I mean by agronomic traits? Probably the biggest agronomic trait uh, that we have is, uh, which has been a surprise to all of us, uh, is herbicide resistance. Uh, and there's a good story about this is Monsanto, the, uh, which is now probably one of the largest uh, you know, sort of, well, it was one of the largest chemical companies in the world, and it was one of the largest chemical companies in the world because it produced the world's most successful herbicide, you know, a chemical that kills plants to get rid of weeds and plants you don't want, called Roundup. Uh, now, you, many of you would be aware that when you produce herbicides, you have a patent but eventually that patent runs out. And Monsanto faced a situation in the 80s that 
they had the most successful chemical in the world, but the patent was going to run out in 10 years. So uh, anyone could produce round. It's a very simple molecule to produce. Anyone could synthesize and sell Roundup. So they thought, well, their profit will be all gone, really, because Roundup, and it did. The cost of Roundup went down enormously. So what they, someone had a very smart idea, uh, is uh, what they decided to do was instead of patenting a chemical that you use on plants, why don't we patent the plant that you can use the chemical on? So what they did was they developed a thing called herbicide resistance. So if you can imagine a, uh, a crop that has a lot of weeds, you know, you have a soybean crop. Uh, at present, you know, you can't spray it with Roundup because you'll kill the crop as well as the weeds. But if you put a resistance, and it was known, and the, the beauty of Roundup as a, uh, as a chemical was that bacteria in the soil deactivate Roundup very quickly. So the beauty of Roundup is you can apply it and then it's deactivated in the soil. So you don't have uh, a long-term effect on your soil of the chemical that you added because the ba bacteria in the soil deactivate it. So of course someone found what those bacteria was and took the deactivation genes from those bacteria and then put them back in a plant. So that you could then uh, have soybeans that had weeds in them. You could spray the soybeans, but they were Roundup resistant because they had that particular gene in them. And that's, so that's what Monsanto started to, 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 uh, you know, to patent. They patented plants that were resistant to their chemical Roundup rather than having patent a chemical that they applied to plants. So that's uh, an agronomic trait and it's probably the major one, and I'll show you some stats in a moment showing how, uh, how big it is. The second wave was uh, the other traits of agronomic traits are disease resistance and, and uh, resistance, in fact, uh, to, as I'll show you an example of this, uh, to insects as well as uh, microbiological diseases. The second way is, well, try to engineer better qualities into your crop. You know, and this is particularly in oil crops. To a lesser extent, starchy crops like wheat and maize. But if you want a particular type of acid in that crop, you can engineer it into it to make it more valuable. And the third is industrial crops, which we probably haven't done too much of that yet. So what's the first way of agronomic crops? Uh, insect protected. Now I'll show you this in a moment. This is the, the corn uh, example that you can have biotech corn that is uh, resistant to a particular insect. Another big example, and probably all the papayas you eat now are one of the big diseases for pawpaw or papayas uh, was a virus, which is now, they've been now protected against that virus using GM technologies. Herbicide tolerant, which we just, this is the soybean. This is the control that you couldn't spray because of all sorts of weeds. This is one that has the so herbicide resistant gene and has been sprayed. Cotton, which I'll show you in a moment here. I'll go back. Uh, this is largely an Australian invention, even though Monsanto uses it now. Uh, cotton is very susceptible to a thing called the cotton bowl weevil. And it's a weevil that eats the bowl where the cotton is produced on the plant. Traditionally, and uh, in Australia, the only way to protect yourself is you had to spray 
repeatedly with very uh, dangerous chemicals <laughs> to knock out the cotton boll weevil so you could get a crop. And the Australian cotton industry in the beginnings uh, in the 70s had big troubles because they were spraying too much and the chemicals which are very toxic to fish and, and to humans uh, were getting into waterways and uh, you know there was an environmental disaster effectively and the cotton industry was threatened of its future uh, if they couldn't find a solution. Well a bit like um, uh, a bit like Roundup uh, what they found was that there was a um, uh, a, microbe, a microbe that produced a toxin to boll weevils. So they engineered cotton plants uh, as this microbe was Bacillus thuringiensis, just a, another, but it produced a toxin and now you know, probably 80%, almost 90% of Australian cotton uh, is Bt, what we call Bt cotton, and it is resistant to the boll weevil. You might have to use one or two sprays early in the year, but not as people were using 20. And the use and the use of chemicals in the uh, in the cotton industry has decreased by 60 to 70 percent. And uh, then to avoid you know, these boll weevil will get a bit smart and evolve to defeat the resistance. So now we have two Bt genes in, which make it very difficult for a boll weevil to mutate against both genes at the same time. You might do one, but you can't do the other. So uh, that's yields have also increased and. Uh, local waterways and that uh, environmentally it's been very good. But this is an example of what we're talking about. This is just a normal cotton crop, probably one that had been sprayed. This is a GM crop next door uh, where the boll weevil, this has been decimated by the boll weevil. This one is resistant to the boll weevil uh, by what it has in its, uh, in its plant, in its leaves. So that's cotton. There's also uh, papaya virus here, and there is uh, also insects, the corn grubs in corn, that are, uh, have been very successful. So they're all, uh, you know, BT also works in corn, but these are all what we call agronomic traits, traits that uh, help you grow bigger crops. The second way is to enhance the quality of food produced you, by silencing endogenous genes or introducing new genes. And uh, margarines that have phytosterols are able to significantly reduce blood cholesterol levels, which that's one of the byproducts. Canola and oils with 2.2 to 5 percent, you know, phytosterols have been developed. The third way is fatty acids. In industrial processes, there are these acids that you can see on the screen um, that are valuable, and you can design plants to produce those acids. And the third wave is lauric canola, which just shows you how this works. You have a canola oil, the same that you would have, it doesn't have any laurate in it. You want laurate, you, want, you inject a laurate gene. Um, from a Californian bay tree into your canola genome, gives you 40%, and then you have another of these genes from coconut, and you ever end up with 70% laurate. So that's the industrial crop. Finally, Christine, you don't have to <laughs> understand this thing, but it was the only thing I could find. Uh, CRISPR is very recent. CRISPR has only been discovered basically in, 19, uh, in 2012, um, and, uh, but it's a gene ed editing technology. It's cheap and it's very efficient. It has great 
potential to modify genomes, although they haven't really been done yet. And it's, a, um, it's early days in this technology, but it's a technology with great, um, great promise uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that because you're not inserting genes into the plant, it may not have to be called genetically modified uh, and it will have better consumer acceptance if that's the case. We'll get back to that in a moment. And, but CRISPR, as you can see, uh, it really has developed incredibly rapidly. It's largely in microbiology and in human biology because there are, you know, you can imagine people with genetic defects. Uh, if embryos have been treated with CRISPR, CRISPR technique, to knock out the genes of the genetic defect that humans have. You know, it's not a common <laughs> treatment yet, but experimentally it's been done. So it's a powerful technology that may help crops in the future. Now, just look at, back to gene technology, just look at what's happened with gene technology. I want to take you on a, a little bit of a, wait a minute, we'll just do one thing I need to do. Uh, where is, I just wanted to, where do, where do you find uh, presenter view? It must be up here somewhere. View. Presenter view. There we go. And then we just run through. Yeah. So, gene technology in developing countries. What's been the very interesting thing in gene technology is, uh, which wasn't predicted, is it's been applied in developing countries, perhaps more than developed countries. And uh, the major reason for that um, is that there has been some consumer resistance uh, in developed countries through the use of gene technology to produce food products. Australia gets away with it at present because cotton is not a food product. It is a, a fibre. But the interesting thing is uh, that, of course, cotton produces cotton seed oil, which does find its way into the food system. So, in 2013, you know, it's a few years ago, uh, 18 million farmers grew biotech crops, but over 90% of that was risk-averse small farmers in developing countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't be apparent to you, but one of the... Uh, when you look at the statistics for chemical damage to people from farm chemicals, they're much greater in developing countries because they don't have the facilities and technologies to handle chemicals safely. You know, we've, we've sent students to developing countries and they've been appalled at the risks that people took with what are dangerous agricultural chemicals. So by avoiding having to use those chemicals, it has helped developing countries a lot to avoid those human health risks. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the sort of interesting things is even though the GM cotton technology was developed in Australia, it has actually hurt the Australian cotton industry. It's been great for the cotton industry on one hand, but because it is used very extensively in India and Pakistan now, which are big cotton producing countries, that the global price of cotton <laughs> has gone down because they can't uh, their yields have gone up enormously because they don't have to pay all that for chemical. Now they, they've got the GM technology. So it'll, it'll come into balance uh, at some point, but it's, it's a very encouraging thing that I find that we have a much less human toll in the production of uh, both food, but particularly uh, fibre. 
The second thing is that, you know, in this, in, you know, 50% reduction in insecticide applications uh, is an important thing. The other thing that happens with uh, GM crops in this agronomic traits is you use fewer sprays, fewer insecticide, so you use fewer fuels. There's fewer passes over the field with a tractor and therefore you burn less fuel. And it allows you to undertake what we call conservation tillage. In other words, you only really, you don't really plough the field, you only sow your new crop but you're able to control the weeds by the use of a herbicide because your crop is herbicide resistant. So there have been advantages. What's interesting though is the five leading biotech countries are Brazil, Argentina, India, China and South Africa, which effectively grow 40% uh, of the global crops and about 41% of the world population, which is good. To give you a bit of a, uh, a run through uh, the, uh, just where we're at at present, which isn't, so this is the total hectares of uh, biotech crops in the world, or really biotech crops. You'll see that it's changing, that uh, if we talk about industrial countries and developing countries and that's a bit of a blurred, uh, blurred definition anyway, but developing countries are one of the largest people um, using this technology. The biotech crops to 13, what's interesting about it is soybeans, and this is largely Roundup Ready soybeans, herbicide resistant, maize, a couple of BT, cotton, and canola. So these are the big ones and of course a lot of Europe's uh, protein sources now grown in Argentina with soybean and Brazil. You can see herbicide tolerance is by far the major trait that has been used. A little bit the insect resistance here but a combination of both, and that of course happens in cotton now. You have herbicide tolerant, but insect tolerance as well. Just to show you what, uh, where it's predominantly grown, conventional means without biotech, of course. Really, of the soybean crop in, in the world, about 80% now is probably GM. cotton. Probably a bit less, but it'll go up to there as well. Corn, not so much, and canola, not so much either. And the other important thing is to think about in GM crops is market acceptance has been a problem. Uh, I know many of you are in a Masters of Food Science course, but uh, for an example, in Australia, uh, both major supermarket chains you know, have pledged they won't stock anything, even though you could stock some that have a GM component. The supermarket chains, because of the reactions of some of their customers to GM product, choose not to stock GM product. You won't find in Woolies or Coles anything anything on the shelves that says contains genetically modified products. And that's because the supermarket chains have, uh, have made a risk averse decision not to risk that. Similarly in Europe, uh, Europe have been a bit interesting uh, because they have been very anti-GMs, uh, but then they've had to, as they frequently do, make accommodations because it got down to the point of all the European animal production depends on a protein source 
and they could decimate the world's fisheries by using pilchards, you know, the sort of very, or sardines essentially. Um, or you could do use soybeans. But the only, when the pilchard harvest failed, the only place they could actually get soybeans was from Argentina and Brazil. And of course, they're all GM. Uh, so Europe, Europe had to back away from that on the argument, well, they're going through an animal before you get to the shelf anyway. Uh, so there's a lot of motion around, uh, still a lot of emotion around uh, the use of GM technologies. And uh, the, in my mind, the evidence is clear, but ultimately it depends on the consumer. If the consumer is not happy and feels it's a dangerous technology, well, you have to respect that. Even though, you know, there is no record of anyone being killed by a genetically modified planters <laughs> or even being made sick by it because there is very tight regulations. Uh, but there is a perception in many circles that it's unnatural. It's an unnatural technology because you're using exotic genes uh, that don't come from plants. And that's, you know, that's a challenge for you guys in your generation if you want to use these technology. It's largely these perceptions. But still, as we seek to you know, engage and solve this next great sort of food, food crisis, I think we're going to need every technology we, uh, we can put our hands on. You know, sensibly used, of course. Uh, the, there is good regulations of gene technology in Australia, and they need to remain. But uh, I don't think it's a, such a dangerous technology. And finally, just, uh, just three key points from these lectures. You know, plant improvement by whatever methods, whether it be selection, breeding, now GM technologies, is the fun fundamentals of our food system, really. <laughs> if you don't have productive plants, you won't be able to produce enough energy for humans on the globe. So it's something that is inexorable. If we're going to feed 9 billion people in 2050, these technologies are going to be required. But, and this is probably where you might find yourself working, the integration of these technologies into the food system uh, will have to be done with sensitivity and transparency. Uh, otherwise, there will be probably a consumer backlash, which we've seen with GMs already. So there you are. Um, thank you. Any, any questions? Or Yes, over there. Sorry? Yeah. 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 That's Roundup. Mm. So, uh, what else do we do about that? How do we control that? Uh, like, we are going to get crops and the weeds are going to resistance to the black water. How do we get what are what should direction should we follow? Yeah. You're absolutely correct. The question was uh, in some uh, weed species have developed glyphosate resistance, and that's known particularly in Australia, it's ryegrass has uh, glyphosate resistant. Uh, the answer to that really is you need to, you need to regulate, but also you need to use these chemicals very carefully. I think, you know, what some of the excesses in the soybean Roundup resistance in the first instance is, is they were, it was there not only for weeds, but it was a way of killing the soybean plant before they harvested, so it was quicker to harvest it. You probably don't need that, you know. I think we have to use these technologies carefully because, you know, biology is a wonderful thing and it's very adaptable. And of course, we get resistance to things if we use things in excess. And, 
you're right, you know, a colleague of mine is probably Australia's foremost uh, herbicide resistant person and that's what he promotes. In fact, one of the, it just shows you how without regulation that things can happen. One of the major sources of Roundup resistance in Australia <laughs> occurs along railway lines because the railways always want to stop fires along this side. They don't want, you know, ungrazed grass beside a... Uh, and they've sprayed, and councils spray Roundup all the time. And of course the plants there are becoming resistant. So there are ways that you can regulate, you can rotate the herbicides you need so you don't always spray Roundup. And again, you get weeds confused about what they're mutating against, whether they're mutating against Roundup or they're mutating against another class of herbicide. So it requires a lot of work. Sorry? Yeah, we should. And that's, cotton has, by putting in a second uh, BT gene, so the insect has to try and evolve against two targets rather than one target. And it'll probably get more sophisticated than that as well. Thank you all. Mm.
say it's like the sense of 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 the sense of